Muchas gracias y muy buenas tardes a todos. Déjenme darles la más cordial bienvenida. Do you, you don't have to use the headphones. Oh, okay. Solamente para darles las buenas tardes a todos, pero como corresponde, yo quiero pasar al inglés, si no les importa, para darle una muy cordial bienvenida a Ha Chun Chang, professor of the University of Cambridge and Raúl Speakers today in 2019 in the Cátedra Previs. Government representatives, dear friends, I think I see a lot of colleagues here around the table, people that you probably also know yourself, Professor. But I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and to begin by expressing our very special thanks to, um, to all of you for being here and to Leonidas Montes because he, he made this, uh, this conference possible because Professor Chang, as you many know, is going to be tomorrow is going to be distinguished by the University of Chile with the honoris causa uh, doctorate. So it's a real pleasure to have you with us today in this 16th uh, session or chapter of the Previs lecture, which today acclaims one of the most influential heterodox economists in the area of development economics. Ha Yung Chang, I, I think, is one of the most important uh, economists of our, of our era. And for us, it's a source of honor and pride to have you in, in this occasion that pays homage to the vocation of our founder, who welcomed the critical thinking by men and women from Latin America and the Caribbean and from other latitudes as well. Uh, many uh, of the lecture series have been, uh, we have a, a lot of very well-recognized intellectuals. Some of them are here, I have to say. Uh, people like uh, the, the name of this room, Celso Furtado, Joseph Stiglitz, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, Rubens Recupero, Danny Roderick, Tulio Harperin, Fernando Sabater, Aldo Ferrer, José Antonio Campo, Danilo Astori, Rolando Cordera, Mariana Mazzucato, and the previous lecturer of Previs uh, uh, series was Ricardo French Davis, who is sitting precisely right in front of you. So what happened is that Previs alerted us from the very beginning of ECLAC's life that may, the main challenge was to think for ourselves, to look at the specificities of our own history and realities, and to devise policies based on these, not on abstract models which disregard crucial determinants of underdevelopment. In this, he explicitly followed Keynes, the great Cambridge economist, who stated that the difficulty in economics lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. For these reasons, we are especially honored to welcome you, Professor Chang, because of your intellectual trajectory and contributions that are so close to our own concerns here in ECLAC. Your book, which you just signed for me, thank you so much, Kicking Away the Ladder, is an expression that you took, by the way, from Frederick List, the great German economist who was an inspiration for the structuralists. It provided a set of policy recommendations in your book that, and you said that orthodox economists prescribe for developing countries what, what's not followed by the now developed economy with themselves. We're in the process of developing, in the words of you, you stated that developed countries did not get where they are now through the policies and the institutions that they are recommending to developing countries today. This is, this is the problem. And structuralists have a long tradition of defending industrial and technological policies and have kept this banner aloft even in a, mer in a very hostile environment. In my own country, the orthodox spirit, Mexico by the way, in, in 1990, uh, the, the, the neoclassical economy was saying that the best industrial policy is none at all. You may remember that, that it was really a disaster. But anyway, you are a very open-minded, pluralistic, and you have a tremendous uh, pluralistic approach to economics. And you, and you said once, let a hundred flowers bloom, as you suggested in your economics, the user's guide that you just signed for one of my colleagues. So I have to say that we, we share with you one concern in, in the world of today, and that is inequality. And I'm sure you're going to touch upon that, but in your user's guide, you also stated that high inequality reduces social cohesion, increasing political instability, 
And this, in turn, discourages investment. And this is what we are also trying to prove here in ECLAC for, for a certain time. So we feel, as, as you, as a very close friend to our institution. We really do. And we have here a, a, a group of uh, young students that are here in the summer school. Of course, it's not summer in Chile, but we call it the summer school anyway. <laughs> but uh, because we, we believe that they, they need to hear from you directly what is happening today in the world. You were born in Seoul, the capital of uh, the Republic of Korea, for those that don't know, but I'm sure you know. You became a graduate student at the Faculty of Economics and Politics in the University of Cambridge in 1986, and you earned your PhD from Cambridge in 1992, with the thesis, by the way, the political economy of industrial policy. You started from there in, in 1992, actually. And you have been there teaching, of course, and now, as far as I know, you are the reader of the, uh, 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 I mean, of the Faculty of Economics at the University of Cambridge. And indeed, you are m one of the most influential economists in the heterodox arena and in the economics of development, with plenty books, I mean, I, 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 they, they made a long list of your 25 books written by you or co-edited with others, and you have also collaborated quite a lot with the UN, which I'm very proud to say, UNDESA, UNCTA, UNDP, and, and many other instances, like the multilateral development banks. But most of all, what I, want to, what I want to highlight in these very, I hope, brief remarks is that what, what you said, what you say today in your website, today in your website you say, the neoclassical school has been the dominant school of economics for the last two generations. And you say, so I have been schooled in it throughout my career. It can provide us with some very useful tools to analyze problems within a given structure, but it's not good at understanding how the institutions, the technologies, politics, and ideas that define the structure evolve over time. So in this criticism to the neoclassical school, you are acknowledging, acknowledging as well a Hayek criticism of neoclassicism for the separation he made of political from economic processes. And I think this is, this is the, the core of the problem we are having today. So I also want to recognize another feature that I found in your, in your career, which is the recognition you have of the influence of Marx in political economy. And you said, with the collapse of communism, people have to come to dismiss Marx as irrelevant. But this is wrong, you say, I'm quoting. I don't have much time for Marx's utopian vision of socialism, nor his labor theory of value. But his understanding of capitalism was superior in many ways to those of the self-appointed advocates of capitalism. This is, for me, a very interesting uh, factor because many people and many students have decided not to study Marx anymore, and I think they should, because as you very well say, he has a good um, grapple of what is uh, capitalism. So we want to thank you for that. I think you have a tremendous, uh, tremendous things to share with us. You have books and you have questions that you have put forward, but I want to say that uh, that in kicking away the ladder, I think has had a significant impact on the discussions around capitalism. And you were recognized in 2003 precisely for this book with the award of Gunnar Mildal Prize for the, by the European Association of Evolutionary Political Economy. But what I want to highlight is that this book develops a very robust discourse centered on an impeccable and careful argued statement that the central capitalist economies, the current developed countries, in the terms set forth by you in that book, have kicked the ladder, patearon la escalera, have kicked the ladder away to prevent the so-called developing countries from reaching them. I think this is powerful. This is very powerful. And that's why I have to recommend this book, Kicking the Ladder, Pateando la Escalera, because it's very true. So, dear friends, if we are to emerge from the harsh economic conditions that prevail today and bring out development paths that are alternative and step with aspirations that revolve around equality as enshrined in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, 
we must pursue economic, industrial, social, and environmental policies. On this road of progressive structural change, I think your thinking and your contribution to progress along this road has been uh, extraordinary and we'll hope it will continue. So we want really to thank you very much for being with us. And I want to bring about a Korean thinker, a poet, poet from Korea, Kim Kwang Kyu, who said, was there anyone who didn't know what everybody felt, what everybody went through? Was there anyone who didn't know in those days? Everybody knew but pretended not to know. What no one could say, what no one could write, was spoken in our language, in our alphabet, was communicated. Was there anyone who didn't know? Don't speak too glibly now, because times have changed. Stop and think. In those days, what were you doing? So thank you for being with us, Dr. Chang. Welcome to CEPAL, and let me hand over the floor to you. Well, thank you, the, Madam Executive Secretary, for that very generous introduction. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here today to deliver the 16th Raoul Prebish Lecture. Uh, Alicia has uh, described me as a heterodox economist. I'll take the term if uh, people find it convenient, but you know, it's a relative notion, isn't it? Because if you're a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, the guy in Rome is the heterodox guy. So <laughs> at least in development economics, that uh, people like me uh, used to be orthodox yeah, in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah? The better way to describe me would be pluralist, because I take good things from everyone. So if uh, people ask me who are the three most uh, influential economists for you, I would say Karl Marx, Friedrich von Hayek, and Herbert Simon. So, you know, no, seriously, I mean, uh, that, that I'm not just uh, saying this uh, to please uh, different people. You know, there are some common elements that, that between these three people in terms of their understanding of institutions and history and that uh, human nature and human behavior. So it's not a glib remark. Anyway, but uh, you know, the intellectual affinity uh, between me and uh, Sepal goes back a long way because I grew up uh, in South Korea. And in the 1980s, when I was a university student, we read a lot of uh, you know, structuralist uh, economics dependency theory, they didn't teach it in the classrooms. Our professors were not all, but almost all of them are neoclassical. So we are all, uh, mostly taught about equilibrium and you know, the stuff like that. But then the country at the time was uh, going through tremendous change. I mean, on the one hand, that, that we had huge rise in living standard. You know, you could almost uh, see it with your bare eyes because uh, the economy is, uh, was uh, growing at 10 percent, 12 percent. Yeah, but then this uh, that change uh, created a lot of social conflict. Yeah, the the, the riot police uh, smashed uh, striking workers. Yeah, <coughs> property developers that uh, hired thugs uh, to clear urban slums uh, to develop new apartment buildings. You know, the, the, there were people the, protesting against the, the, the rural debt, and you know, so that I, I and my friends uh, couldn't really take uh, the, what we are taught in the classroom very seriously, huh? because the, the professors are telling us, you know, everything will the, come back to equilibrium, you know, with a short adjustment period. You know? they didn't talk about you know, conflict. They didn't talk about the structural transformation. So we are naturally the, looking for alternatives, and yeah, we got to read. There are a lot of uh, Celso Frutado, yeah, Raul Prebish, yeah, and other the, 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 the people in structuralist uh, tr uh, traditions, as well as uh, that, uh, Marx and dependency theory. So, you know, 
uh, my intellectual affinity uh, with this organization is not accidental. It uh, has a long history, going back at least uh, to 1982 when I entered the uh, university uh, uh, in Korea. The, sorry, I forgot to bring my reading glasses, so I'm going to put my normal glass, glasses at, uh, in a slightly odd angle so that I can uh, read my note. The last time I was in Sepal, was uh, in 2001. I came to this uh, the centenary of uh, Raoul Prebish. So it was a, a, a very big occasion. And in the intervening 18 years, things have changed so much. Actually, at that time, I, after this, went to Brazil for a kind of sub-conference of that centenary that happened in Rio. And then I had a short family holiday there. And the day where, uh, that I went back to England, these planes were hitting the World Trade Center on TV. So that was that, 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 that etched in my memory. And since then, we had what? I mean, the, the Iraq war, the you know, war on terror, the rise of right-wing populism and racism around the world. In economic terms, we have witnessed this slow unraveling of the neoliberal economic world order established in the 80s and 90s. We've seen the, of course, uh, the 2008 global financial crisis, but also slow crumbling of the WTO system, which I'm going to talk about today, and the rise of China. In the intervening 18 years, uh, we have seen huge transformations of uh, both economics and politics uh, uh, around the world. But uh, more specifically in relation to the international economic system, to whose reform Raoul Prebish uh, devoted uh, his life, there's a particular concern with the future of the world trading system, with the aggressive trade policy of the Trump administration in the US. So in the name of punishing unfair competition from China, the Trump administration has imposed extra tar tariffs on the Chinese imports. In the same spirit, the US renegotiated the free trade agreements with uh, the Korea, with uh, the, the Mexico and Canada, the NAFTA, basically renegotiated it uh, in its favor by using the threat of uh, punitive tariffs uh, that, uh, as a uh, uh, bargaining chip. It has even tried to use tariff uh, to reduce uh, migration from Mexico, although it hasn't really that, that, uh, worked out. And all of these, especially in the context of increasing racism and xenophobia in the rich world, have increased the concern that the current world trading order based on multilateralism, that is the World Trade Organization or the WTO system, is under serious threat. And this is, of course, uh, particularly bad news uh, for developing countries because it doesn't take a genius to know that developing countries fare better under, under multilateralism because individually they are weak. So if uh, they did uh, bilateral uh, negotiation or small group negotiation with uh, the powerful countries, they don't have uh, as much bargaining power. So developing countries that, uh, do better on the multilateralism. And the fact that multilateralism is the friend of the weak is shown by the fact that the rich countries have constantly attempted to undermine it whenever it doesn't work for them. And it is uh, nowhere more clearly shown than in the evolution of the WTO. You know, when the, the WTO was uh, first uh, instituted in 1995, the developed countries declared their commitment to multilateralism. So much so that uh, they, for the first time, allowed one country, one vote with no qualification in a major international organization. You know, the UN, well, five prominent members of Security Council has a veto. Yeah? The IMF, the World Bank, it's run on the basis of your share contribution. Yeah? 
so that there is only one major international organization where it is one country, one vote, and it's the WTO, and that is very significant. But it soon turned out that this renewed commitment to multilateralism by the rich countries <coughs> came about only because these countries thought that they could make the developing countries to do whatever they want in the WTO. You know, in theory, it's a one country, one vote, but it is supposed to work according to consensus, so the votes are rarely taken. Especially in the early days, there were these uh, notorious uh, green room meetings where only the rich countries and a handful of uh, developing countries that couldn't be ignored, like you know, China, India, Pakistan, and so on, were invited. And in the ministerial meeting of uh, <coughs> Seattle 1999, Cancun 2003, you had these incidences where developing country delegates who were not invited to the green room, who tried to get in there, were physically thrown out by the security guards. And those occasions have developing countries realize that the multilateralism promised by the rich countries was basically little more than a lip service. And this has made them put up a strong resistance uh, to unreasonable demands, like the MIA, the Multilateral Investment Agreement, which was uh, the very strongly pushed uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, although it, because of uh, the developing country resistance uh, didn't uh, come to fruition. And the so-called NAMA negotiation, Non-Agriculture Market Access Negotiation, which was uh, the key to the so-called Doha Development Agenda, declared soon after 9-11 by the President uh, George W. Bush. And when they couldn't get this thing through, basically the rich countries decided to abandon multilateralism. You know, it's not Donald Trump uh, who has uh, invented American uh, attitude against uh, the multilateralism. Well before Trump, uh, the U.S. Uh, basically throughout the uh, Obama period had disengaged uh, from the WTO and uh, pursued bilateral and regional agreements, yeah? like uh, the current uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP. You know, Trump is a more recent, more aggressive manifestation of this that, 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 that trend. I mean, it's not new. The EU may not have uh, been, uh, may not have rejected multilateralism as much as uh, the US has, but it has also actively engaged in divide and rule in its uh, trade negotiations with uh, developing countries. When it was told that uh, the Lome Convention, which uh, that, uh, gave uh, uh, trade preference uh, to its uh, former co colonies, the so-called ACP countries, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, when it was told that this uh, the, the convention was against the WTO rule, it said, OK, we are going to then renegotiate uh, a new trade and investment agreement with these uh, ACP countries that conform to the WTO rules. Yeah? Now, very interestingly, when it uh, did that, it actually divided these uh, 90 plus countries into seven regional groups. Yeah? So there's uh, one uh, Caribbean group, one West African group, East African group, and so on. So each group uh, became much weaker. Yeah? They were not 90 plus countries anymore. They were seven, they were 10. And some of these countries had no real capacity for trade negotiations. So I was told that in negotiating with the Central African group, the EU actually wrote the position paper for the Central African countries. So this is our position, this is your position. Let's have a talk. I don't call that negotiation.
In short, uh, the multilateral trading system has been falling apart in the last decade, decade and a half. It's not because of Trump. It's been a long-running trend. And it is uh, in the interest of the developing countries to revive this. But in doing so, it is not enough to return to the WTO system because that system has inherent biases against developing countries and therefore needs to be radically reformed if it, if it is to be truly pro-developmental. And in saying this, I very much draw on the ideas of Raoul Prevish, which are embedded in the call for the so-called NIEO, New International Economic Order, launched in the United Nations 55 years ago in 1974. The WTO system is based on the principle that free trade is the best for all countries under all circumstances. However, free trade between countries at different levels of development is harmful in the long run for countries that are economically less developed. Now, this is a fundamental insight of uh, the structuralist school and before him, Friedrich List, before him, Actually, Alexander Hamilton, the first ever Treasury Secretary of the United States, who developed this theory of infant industry protection, which were, was uh, later developed by that uh, list. In the short run, free trade is not always, but uh, almost always, going to allow all trading partners to maximize their outputs and maximize their incomes. There is no dispute about that. The problem is in the long run, because in the long run, having free trade between countries at different levels of development hampers the economic development of the less, developing, uh, less developed uh, countries by making it impossible for them to create high productivity, high technology industries. This is, of course, you know, the fundamental insight of the infant industry argument, namely the argument that the governments of less economically developed nations need to protect and nurture young industries against competition from superior foreign competitors until it grows up and can compete in the real world, you know, uh, in the international market. You know. This is that, that exactly for the same reason why you send your kid to school. You know. So. Actually, in one of my books that are making this point, uh, Bad Samaritans, I have a chapter called My Six-Year-Old Son Should Get a Job. Now, actually, when I wrote that book, uh, my son was actually six years old. You know? So I start the chapter by saying, I have this uh, six-year-old son. Uh, of course, I don't use uh, such uh, strong language in the book, but I say, this guy is a total parasite. Huh? No, because I pay for everything. Yeah? His accommodation, his food, his heating, his water, his education, his TV, his uh, Nintendo games. Yeah? So that got me thinking, you know, actually, why am I paying for all this? Yeah? yeah, you go to Ecuador, you go to Pakistan, there are children who work from the age of four or five. He's perfectly capable of making a living. Yeah? And then I realized that actually this is a win-win solution. Yeah? Because not only will I save money, he will become a better person. Yeah? No, he has to survive the discipline of the labor market. You know, he has to practice uh, his trade, whatever it is, uh, selling chewing gums or the, the shining shoes. You know, no more wasting time in front of TV. No, no more wasting time with the uh, Nintendo games. Yeah, so w why do I not do it? Yeah. Well, I don't know about other people, but my understanding is that, well, if I invested in this guy for another 12, 15 years, he could become a much more productive person than a shoe shiner. Yeah. You know, he could become an architect. Uh, you know, he could become a, the, the accountant. Yeah. Nuclear physicist, 
where he's uh, studying biology, so my prediction was uh, completely wrong, but you know. On the other hand, if I kicked him into the labor market at the age of six, what can you become? Yeah? I mean, he'll start with this uh, classic uh, the, the, the child labor professions, selling chewing gums and the, the, the cleaning uh, car windows at the junction, or, or the shining shoes. Maybe if he really works hard, he could uh, own a shop. But there's no chance that he'll become an architect or a nuclear physicist. Yeah? He has to study and go to university, get a degree. Yeah, yeah so this is a blindingly simple logic. Yeah? In the same way in, the, 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 in which the, the we protect our children and nurture them until they grow up, economically backward countries need to nurture and protect uh, their industries. Yeah? And it is precisely on this uh, logic that all of today's developed countries, with uh, very few exceptions, use protectionism when they are trying to catch up with the more advanced uh, countries. You know, today we think that Britain invented free trade and the U.S. Uh, the, the promoted it, but they were actually the most protectionist countries in history. You know, during their respective catch-up periods, so from the mid-18th century to the mid-19th century in the case of Britain, from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century, in the case of the United States, their average industrial tariffs were 40 to 50%. You know, to put it into perspective, today's developing countries have average industrial tariff rate of around 10%. Yeah? You can uh, see for yourselves uh, that the kind of protection, uh, protectionism uh, they had in the, their the catch-up periods. Of course, that uh, when Britain became the top dog in the 1860s, it uh, the abolished uh, tariffs, practiced uh, free trade until the 1930s. But it got there through protectionism. Right? This is why Friedrich List said that this is uh, the, like so, uh, yeah. Someone climbing up to the top with a ladder and kicking the ladder away so that others cannot follow because uh, at the time Britain was preaching free trade to Germany and the US. Hmm? Even when the average tariffs are not so high, countries are provided the strategic protection to important industries. So Germany and Sweden in the late 20s and early, uh, late 19th and early 20th century had relatively low tariff on average, but individual industries got high tariff. But Belgium's the most interesting case uh, in the late uh, the 19th century, early 20th century, it had the uh, average industrial tariff rate of only nine to 10 percent. But some industries got very high protection, 30 to 60 percent for textiles, 85 percent for iron, and so on. Later, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they also practiced uh, selective protectionism. I mean, they were not, I mean, the, the, their tariffs were not as low as the, the Belgian one, because that, the, in the uh, 60s and 70s, average industrial tariff in Korea and Taiwan were 30 to 40 percent, but some industries are even higher. These countries also used uh, widespread quantitative restrictions, so bans on imports, import quotas. Many of them practiced uh, bans on export of raw materials. Uh, so Britain, which uh, started out as a raw material supplier uh, to the Woolen textile manufacturers uh, in the low countries, that is uh, the uh, Netherlands and Belgium today. 
in its attempt to develop its own woolen manufacturing industry, put the, I mean, not permanent, but the occasional bans on the, the, the export of uh, raw wool so that the domestic producers uh, could uh, have uh, cheaper input. Yeah? It's not just in terms of trade, but uh, other areas uh, like uh, regulation of foreign direct investment and intellectual property rights, subsidies, government procurement, just about everywhere that today's rich countries uh, practice what they are proscribing against today that, uh, in relation to the developing countries. So I don't have time to go through this, but uh, basically when the, they were at the receiving end of uh, foreign direct investment, many of these countries that uh, put uh, very stiff uh, restrictions on the foreign direct investment, you know, especially in the post-World War II period, Japan virtually banned uh, foreign direct investment until the, the 1980s. Before that, the U.S. Uh, the had heavy restrictions on the, the foreign direct investment. Finland classified all funds with more than 20% foreign ownership as dangerous enterprises. I didn't invent this term. This is an official Finnish term. You know, foreigners got the subtle hint and kept away from the country until the 1990s when it joined the European Union and opened up uh, to foreign direct investment. Intellectual property rights, uh, same story. You know, that they had very lax uh, the protection of intellectual property, especially against uh, the foreigners' intellectual property. You know, Switzerland and the Netherlands didn't even have a uh, patent law until the early 20th century. Most countries uh, didn't allow substance patterns in chemicals and pharmaceuticals uh, until the 1960s and 70s. Canada and Spain abolished that, uh, introduced that uh, substance patterns only in the 1992. You know, you might have that, uh, thought counterfeiting was uh, invented in East Asia. No, it was uh, invented in Germany. In the 19th century, they used to make a lot of fake made in England products. No, it became such a problem that in 1862, the British Parliament even revised uh, its uh, the trademark law, the, at the time called the Merchandise Act, and said that the trademark description should include the place of manufacture. And they thought that this will that, that dispatch the Germans, but the Germans are far too clever and far too determined to go away. They started uh, the exporting watches that look uh, exactly like English watches with made in Germany, printed in the box, but not on the watch. Yeah? The best uh, story I can tell you is that this uh, German firm, which uh, used to export uh, industrial sewing machines with uh, North England machine uh, splashed on the body and made in Germany tucked underneath the machine. The only minor problem was that this sewing machine was so heavy, you needed six people to lift it, so no one got to check uh, the where it was made. My favorite uh, story is that uh, from Japan in the 1950s, the Japanese were desperate to increase uh, export, but then at the time, Japan had a reputation for uh, making uh, shoddy products. Yeah? So they really had a, a reputation problem, and someone came up with this uh, brilliant idea that there's a little town as of Tokyo called USA, spelled U-S-A. So they started uh, exporting all these made in USA products. And when the Americans protested, they said, no, 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 you have to improve your English. Your country's name is capital U dot capital S dot capital A dot. This is just capital U, no dot, small s, no dot, small a. Yeah? <laughs> You know, basically everyone did it when they had to. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, uh, you know, that when I that, uh, go to the, the developing countries, I uh, tell them, if your per capita income is uh, less than $10,000, please uh, uh, go ahead and pirate copy my books. Yeah? No, because I studied with uh, pirate copied books. Yeah? I'm not going to that, that refuse that uh, privilege uh, to other people. Yeah? And, of course, uh, today Koreans complain, oh, 
the Chinese, the Vietnamese, they pirate copy our CDs, DVDs, yeah? Probably some of those people that are that, that trying to prevent this studied their copyright law with pirate copy textbooks in the 1980s, yeah? So kicking away the ladder is that, 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 that keep ha uh, keeping happening, yeah? Anyway, so much for that. I mean, that, that, I, mean I could uh, spend two days uh, just talking about these things. But uh, by showing that the history of development policy in today's rich countries contradicted uh, the, the WTO agreement, center left and right, I'm not saying that the global trading system today necessarily needs to allow all the past practices. What is important is the principle. Huh? The principle is that a truly developmental multilateral system needs to be based on what I call the principle of asymmetric protectionism. Huh? It's a simple idea, you know. The economically weaker countries are allowed to protect and regulate more than the stronger ones and they are expected to reduce uh, the use of these uh, extra policy measures only gradually as they develop and catch up. Yeah? I mean, nothing original. Yeah? Of course, uh, when I say this, many people say that, yeah, but the multilateral system should have a level playing field, you know. Wouldn't it be unfair if in a football game, you know, the playing field is uh, tilted and the Brazilians uh, have to attack from downhill and Argentinians have to the, 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 uh, attack from uphill. Yeah? That will be grossly unfair. And we need a level playing field in a multilateral system. You know, multilateral, the, the, uh, sorry, level playing field is, you know, like, uh, as the Americans say, the uh, motherhood and apple pie huh? is definitionally good that you cannot possibly object to it. You know? I mean, because it sounds like you want uh, an unfair system. You know? But I say that this uh, does notion has to be rejected if you are going to build a world trading system that is truly pro-developmental. It is, of course, unfair to have a tilted playing field when the two teams are equal. But uh, if you have a football game in which one team is the Brazilian national team and the other team is uh, made up of 12-year-old 12 12 year girls, it is only fair that the girls attack from up the hill and the Brazilians defend from down the hill. Of course, in real life, you, are, you don't see that kind of tilted playing field because unequal players are structurally prevented from competing against each other. Yeah? You know, there are these age groups, uh, gender divisions. Yeah? And it's not just football. Yeah? Baseball and many other sports have uh, the age uh, the, the groups, gender divisions. And many sports have uh, weight classes. Yeah? Boxing, wrestling, judo, taekwondo. Yeah? In the lighter ways of boxing, these uh, weight bands are so narrow, they are basically two to three pounds, yeah? one to 1 1.5 kilos. Yeah? So in boxing, you think it's uh, so grossly unfair that one of the contestants is uh, the, the two kilos heavier than the other guy you structurally make it impossible for them to compete against each other by putting one guy in one class and the other guy in another class. And in international trade, you think it's uh, perfectly fine for, uh, for Honduras uh, to compete on equal terms with uh, Switzerland. Huh? This has to change. Of course, uh, when I say that, uh, that people often come back and say, yeah, but uh, isn't that why we have uh, SDT, you know, Special and Differential Treatment? Developing countries, yes, have some, sorry. De developing countries have some uh, special treatment, as they say. 
So the least developed countries get some extra provision, like uh, they can use export subsidies, uh, which are banned for everyone else. But I would uh, first of all point out that these uh, extra provisions are minimal. Huh? And more importantly, except for the least developed countries, <coughs> other developing countries are expected basically to abide by the same rule. The only provision they get is that they can implement these rules with a bit of a uh, time lag, yeah? five years, ten years. But in the end, uh, the, you are supposed to uh, play by the same rule. More importantly, I think that uh, it's uh, wrong to use the word special in special and differential treatment. You know, ap applying different rules uh, to countries with uh, differential needs and capabilities is not a special treatment. You know, calling these special treatment is uh, like saying that ramps are for wheelchair users and braille writings are for blind people are special treatment. No, they shouldn't be called special treatment. They are just differential treatment for differential people. Huh? Now, this that uh, languages are very important. Yeah? You know, people who are against the uh, inheritance tax uh, that like to call it death tax. Yeah? Once you begin to call it death tax, it sounds outrageous. Yeah? You cannot even have the freedom to die. Yeah? You have to pay tax to die. Yeah, then a lot of people think, yeah, that's quite unfair, isn't it? Yeah? So the, we need to be very careful with the language. I mean, of course, that the uh, SDT was uh, the, the advocated by the developing countries themselves that uh, in the uh, early days of uh, the, the struggle for a uh, fairer international system, but I think uh, they made a mistake. Yeah? This word special has to be dropped. So in short, a truly pro-development and multilateralism needs to provide the maximum possible amount of policy space in which countries can pursue policies according to their own capabilities and needs. And in this sense, my argument is an updated version of the NIEO that Raoul Prebish advocated, or you may call that a new NIEO or NNIEO. Of course, uh, this will immediately make people skeptical. You know, NIO didn't work. Actually, it create, created a backlash you know, in the 80s when the, the, the developing countries got into the debt crisis and so on. The rich countries really hit back even more strongly than they would have otherwise because they were afraid that uh, this NIEO was uh, getting traction and they wanted to roll it back permanently. Yeah? And indeed, that, uh, you may argue that things are even worse uh, today. There are a few factors here. First of all, the post-colonial guilt that some of the rich countries had in the 1970s, because you know, a lot of countries were still colonies then, even countries that have gone independent, I mean, even the earliest examples that uh, hadn't been independent for more than uh, 30 years, a lot of African countries uh, became independent in the 1960s. So that there was a lot of post-colonial guilt, and you know, even within the rich countries, there was some traction for this idea of uh, NIO. I mean, the, the German chancellor, Willy Brandt, uh, was uh, the one of uh, the advocates of this uh, in the rich world, that is gone. Yeah? I mean, there are even the, well, I mean, there are a few exceptions that, uh, that became in the independent in the 1990s, but by the late 70s, most developing countries have become independent, and, you know, that's uh, 50 years ago. Yeah? So actually, there are very few people alive uh, who have the memory of colonialism and 
uh, imperialism. So that guilt is gone. So the rich countries are being more aggressive. Secondly, there is no longer the systematic comp systemic competition between the capitalist bloc and the socialist bloc, which had given developing countries some bargaining power. I mean, countries like India played this very cleverly. If they were not happy with what the Americans were offering, they tried to approach the Soviet Union. If they were not uh, happy with uh, the, what the Soviets were offering, they uh, went to the American side. You cannot play that game anymore. Eh? Also, the very pushback against the NIO in the neoliberal period has made some ideas in the NIO very difficult, if not impossible, to implement, like the uh, code of conduct for transnational corporations. I mean, this has uh, become very difficult to implement because of the TRIMS agreement in the WTO. And finally, the dominance of uh, neoliberal ideology in the last few decades, although weakening, has made the developing countries more accepting of the current international economic order. There are very, very few countries that were, I mean, that have leaders that that, uh, that are as radical as you know people like Nkrumah and uh, Kenyatta and those people in those days. So at one level, you could say that uh, the chance of NIO or NNIO that are happening is, it, is even more remote uh, than in the 1970s. But I think uh, there are also factors that uh, work the other way. I mean, I uh, can think of three categories uh, here. One is uh, the changes in the structure of the world economy. Another is the changes in our ideas. And the third group is that, uh, what I call contingent factors. So let's uh, go through them and think uh, about them uh, together. So changes in the world economy. The developing countries now have much more weight in the global economic system. In 1974, of course, uh, uh, exactly who are included in these uh, changes all the time, so it, uh, it's not a kind of uh, direct comparison, but uh, the basically high-income countries accounted for nearly 80% of the world economy. Now it doesn't even account for two-thirds of it. The interaction between the developing countries have become much more important than before. Even compared to the uh, mid-90s when the WTO order came into being, South-South trade has increased a lot. It was around 42% in the May, mid 1980s. Sorry, I should uh, be more precise. South South trade, as a proportion of uh, all international trade, used to be around 42% uh, in the mid 1990s. Now it's at uh, 57 And not all of it is because of China. Because that, uh, even excluding China, this uh, rose from 35% to 42%. So a lot of it is China, but it's not entirely China. Eh? Also, China, India, and other developing countries are emerging as important international financial actors in terms of lending, foreign aid, foreign direct investment. And you have uh, the countries like Korea, which although now is a high-income country, still has memory of being a developing country and is more open to ideas of uh, the kind of uh, reforming the international economic order, being an important financial actor in the global economy. And thirdly, now we have uh, southern-led international financial institutions like the New Development Bank and the Asian Infra Infrastructure Investment Bank that <clears throat> give some counterweight to the northern-led multilateral institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, the IDB, and the ADB. So all this means that developing countries are less dependent on the rich countries and therefore can be more forceful in their demands for a new, new international economic order. 
Our ideas have also changed, not least because of the historical legacy of the NIO. Many things that were considered radical during the days of uh, uh, Raoul Prebish are now accepted and have actually been realized to an extent. You know? I mean, when the, the developing countries called for increasing foreign aid, uh, it was initially laughed off. You know? But now that uh, there are countries that, that, uh, which have already over-fulfilled uh, this 0.7% uh, of GDP target for foreign aid, that ca cancellation was uh, that, that considered a pie in the sky. Some of it has happened through the hippic or highly indebted, uh, 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 sorry, I uh, forget the acronym, uh, HIPIC initiative. Also, we shouldn't forget that despite uh, it not really working well in practice, the introduction of a one country, one vote system in the WTO is a quite a radical change. Eh? So a lot of things that used to be considered radical in the 70s now are accepted as you know, standard. And then there are contingent factors. One is uh, the climate change. You know, the urgency of the problem is making us realize that the humanity is bound up in a single fate, and thereby is uh, putting increasing pressure on the rich countries to do more to help developing countries. And one of the important elements here is uh, transport technology for climate mitigation and adaptation. And large-scale technology transfer from the north to the south, which was uh, once again considered a pie in the sky in the days of NIO, is not unrealistic anymore because uh, the, the, given the urgency of the problem, actually there is a real possibility that this is uh, going to happen. Yeah. Okay, we limited yeah, kind of uh, mandate, but you know this is uh, not insignificant. And the other is the China factor. You know, China is in a historically unprecedented position of being a major actor in the global economy while still being a developing country. No country has been in that position. China used to account for not even 3% of the global economy in 1974. Today it's 16% and rising. Okay, the pace of acceleration that uh, is decreasing, but still, I mean, uh, it is that uh, rising. Of course, I'm not saying that China is uh, that, uh, necessarily a champion of the collective interest of uh, developing countries. That will be very naive to say that. Yeah? Nor am I saying that uh, there isn't an element of dependency type of relationship between China as a manufacturer and other developing countries as raw material the exporters. But it is undeniable that China's unique status makes it behave rather differently from the other big economies in terms of aid policy, its approach to foreign direct investment, its approach to infrastructural development. I'm not saying that all of, in all of these areas, uh, China is necessarily better than other countries, but they are different, and on the whole, is uh, more understanding of the developing countries. And having China as a potential lender, investor, and trading partner gives uh, developing countries greater bargaining power when dealing with the rich countries and the international financial institutions that they dominate. You know, in the 80s and 90s, there was only one bank in town called the World Bank. If you didn't like that bank, you couldn't borrow money. Now you have all these uh, alternative possibilities, uh, direct lending and investment from China, but also southern dominated uh, the international financial institutions. So developing countries have uh, more bargaining power. And I cannot really predict how these different factors pulling in different directions will 
affect uh, the future shape of uh, international economic order. But I think uh, the, the picture is uh, not simple, and we have to uh, work to change that. Okay, let me conclude. The developing countries need to fight against the attempt of the rich countries to undermine multilateralism, because multilateralism is the friend of the weak. But they cannot stop at restoring the current multilateral system, that is the World Trade Organization system. The international system needs to be reformed to a more pro-developmental way. We need a NNIEO, new, new international economic order, based on the recognition that the international economic system should maximize the policy space in which uh, different countries with different needs and capabilities can adopt economic policies that are most suited to them. There are factors that work against uh, progress towards this new order, but there are also other factors that are facilitating it, as I uh, try to argue. Of course, uh, if it ever happens, this change will be slow in coming. So in the meantime, developing countries need to cope with a bias system. A lot of people think that there's uh, no policy space left anymore, but this is not true. There's a lot that can be done in this regard, but that discussion is for another occasion. Thank you.